You know, one of the chapters in the new book, Falling Down and Getting Up, is a chapter I call the, the Endless Vows. I think they always return us to a life of feeling and a larger life of spirit and what matters. And the four vows are help, thank you, I'm sorry, and I love you. Hello, Mark. A warm welcome to the show. Oh, thank you. It's great to be with you again. It's lovely to see you again. I remember that I interviewed you many years ago. It was in my old, old apartment and so many things have happened since then. And you're still writing these amazing books. And now you have a new book that have just come out, Falling Down and Getting Up. And that is part of, you know, the other 25 books that you've written. <laughs> You are a poet, philosopher, you've been on Oprah many times and you're doing such amazing work. And the last time I really enjoyed our conversation, I, I remember we spoke about suffering. It was just before Christmas, like it is right now. So I feel like today we're also going to go deep. <laughs> That's my expectation. Yes, thank you. Now, um, I'm curious because I know one of your books is called The Book of Awakening. And on my show, we speak a lot about awakening. And I get curious about how your own awakening was like, because I know that you had cancer and that really changed your life. So was that when your awakening process started or was it earlier? Please yeah. share with us. Awakening. So, so first, let me just share about about awakening. That I think everyone will get an opportunity to be dropped into the depth of life, and you know, often it can be something that is difficult or even life threatening. Um, but it's not always that. It can also be wonder and joy and surprise and beauty and grace and being loved unconditionally for the first time. So it's not just suffering. We, we don't have to seek suffering, uh, you know, like gravity we will get our share um, just because of the nature of life. So, so within that context, you know, for me, um, yeah, very much I'm, I'm 72. Uh, when I met someone my age when I was younger, I thought they were ancient. It doesn't seem so old now. Um, but when I was in my 30s, as you know, I've written about, I had a rare form of lymphoma, which I almost died from. And that was my uh, being thrown into the depth of life. And so I was uh, awakened to the workings of the heart. And um, that was before I wrote the Book of Awakening. I wrote the Book of Awakening on the other side of my cancer journey. And so, you know, a couple of things that happened to me in that journey was not through any wisdom on my part, but simply by virtue of being, you know, grown upside down and inside out. Um, I was in my head a lot before that experience. And I woke up the other side, everything had dropped into my heart. And so ever since then, my mind has followed my heart and not the other way around. And the other thing that, that happened is that I was raised Jewish. I have a deep tie to the Jewish heritage, but I was offered so, so many blessings from all different traditions, people from all faiths, formal and informal, even atheists and scientists and that when I was blessed to still be here, I wasn't, and all these years later, I'm still not wise enough to know what worked and what didn't. And so I was challenged to believe in everything. And so ever since then, I've been a student of all paths and all my work and my teaching tries to affirm the common center of all paths and the unique gifts of each. And I'd say the, la the last like thing about awaken awakening is that, you know, I discovered th that all that matters is right where we are. You know, a menacing assumption 
in life has always been, but is more so in our modern age, is that life is always over there. If I could just get over there, if I could just have that relationship or that experience or achieve this, then, then, then I'll be happy, I'll be at peace. And if there's anything I've learned through my life that awakening opens us to, it's to the mystery that there is no there. There's only here. Now, certainly we, we travel vast distances. You're a continent away, an ocean away, and I am on the surface. But even when we're talking like this, we uncover the same moment, the same eternal moment, which is always here. I thought it was very interesting what you said, that you sort of embrace all directions, uh, because I identified a bit with that, because in my work with Wisdom from North, especially in the beginning, I was trying to find that one teaching, that one truth, that one way. And the more I interviewed amazing teachers like yourself, the more I sort of understood that there's so many ways. And in the beginning, that got me a bit confused. And I was wondering if you could speak a little bit to how you've sort of found your a balance in that, because I see many people hold on to one direction or one school of thought. And then sometimes they are like teachings are contradictory. And then my mind gets confused. So what should I believe in? And then I go into my heart. So what resonates? But still, my mind really wants to know, but what's the truth here? So how have you sort of navigated that, that you're so like so open and acceptive of all directions? Well, I think that, you know, one of the things humbly that goes back to um, that cancer journey is, you know, when people were so kind to offer me help, I didn't, add, I didn't have any prerequisites. I didn't say, you know, I had a, a woman who was Catholic who offered me a rose petal in a gold purse that she said had fallen from the sky in the Philippines by a miracle by Mary. And she offered it to me to help me heal. Well, I didn't say, oh, well, I don't believe in that. No, thanks. I said, thank you. And I put it by my bed side. And so I learned quickly that there are no prerequisites to being open other than to be open. It doesn't have to fit my worldview. It, and we, we suffer this today. It doesn't have to fit my opinions or my, my beliefs. And so what became the barometer is the heart, is whatever, and this is a question that I often ask in simple ways all the time, which I offer to people who are listening, and um, is when troubled by something or something feels contradictory or complex, I ask, is what's before me life-giving and heartening, or is it life-draining and disheartening? Hmm. And if it's life-giving and heartening, then I'm, even if it's difficult, then I hold nothing back. If it's life-draining, what am I doing there? So, you know, throughout history, and it's not, when we look at traditions, let me say a word about that, that all the different paths, certainly anyone can find their way by devoting themselves to one particular path. That's just not how it happened for me. So I don't, uh, you know, so I, I welcome even, you know, all of that, as well as what's in your spiritual toolbox. So I look, not with judgment, but I look to each tradition and try on different things, practices, and say, oh, that feels right for me, that I can put that in my toolbox. And so it's a, it's a matter of having filling our individual practices with with all the things that seem to work for us so you know back back in the um the renaissance in the medici garden which was the famous you know where lorenzo medici gathered all the great geniuses and artists of the time and supported them there was a young man named pico who was a brilliant humanist and philosopher 
at the age of 24, he knew like 16 languages. And while the other people, like Michelangelo was sculpting and other people were painting, he wanted just what we're talking about. He wanted to try and see if there was one unifying uh, principle or value that was at the heart of all the known traditions. And he read everything he could. And then he wrote what was called the 900 Theses. And Lorenzo called him after he did all of this after several years and said, okay, share what you've learned. And he said one thing. He said, I've, from all these things I've read and, and studied, the only thing I've learned is that friendship is the end of all philosophies. Oh, that's beautiful. Yeah. Now, when you speak about that, when you had your awakening, that you were very in your head and then you drop down into your mind. Now, like intellectually, I, I understand that. And yet I feel like that's not sort of my experience very often. Uh, even though I know I want to be in my heart, I want to meet uh, people from my heart, I want to meet difficulties uh, through my heart. I'm just having like a practical dif difficulty right now, uh, which is pretty big, but it, it's practical. It has to do with my apartment. Someone who's not paying what they should pay and it's a big deal. And then I'm thinking, okay, so how can I meet this with my heart? But I still feel this fear. Whoa, what if this is not working out? What if this and this happens to me because of this? Uh, and the people I care about. And when I move into fear, it's so difficult to be in the heart. <laughs> well, you're, you're describing uh, uh, something that all human beings experience. And it's also, we're seeing it around the world as well. And we all have this choice every day and every generation to choose between love and fear. So it's not that the heart can't be discerning and cautious and make good decisions. See, being in the heart just doesn't mean, oh, everything's wonderful. No, it means looking carefully and clearly and not being governed by fear. So the, the legitimate place of fear is to alert us to real danger. But what happens because we're human, I know I experience it too, is we inflate the fear. And we, we well, it's very normal. We go, what if? Oh my God, what if? What if this? And so there is a part of us that needs to try it on. But one of the things that I think is a practice for me that I've discovered is whenever I'm afraid of anything or is something difficult is coming, all things are possible, but none are yet true. And so while I need to say, what if? What if? then I need to come back to what I know in the moment and not live out there in the fear, but to come back and go, okay, but what I do know is this and we're not there yet. So always returning to the moment we're standing on, because even if the moment we're in is one of difficulty or pain, it is known. It is known and it will evolve. So that's what I think that's a practice of, yes, try things on, but not. I've, I've learned that fear is something to be moved through, not obeyed. So if I, when I'm afraid, if I ask my fear, what should I do? It'll say, oh, I thought you'd never ask, be more afraid. So I don't ask my fear, I acknowledge my fear. And let, let me tell you this wonderful uh, story about fear and pain. It's an ancient anonymous teaching story from India. There's a, a master and apprentice always. And the truth is that the master in this case is very annoyed by his apprentice because all he does is complain, complain, complain. So the master says to the apprentice, I want you to get a handful of salt put it in a glass of water and bring it to me quietly. So he does, and the master says, well, drink. And he takes a drink, 
and he spits it out. The master says, what's the matter? And he says, oh, it's bitter. The master says, I want you to get the same exact amount of salt, carry it in your hands, and follow me quietly. And he does, and the master leads him to a lake. And he says, put the salt in the lake, and he does. And the master says, drink. And he kneels down and he scoops up water and it dribbles down his chin. And the master says, well, and the apprentice says, it's fresh. And the master looks at the apprentice and says, stop being a glass, become a lake. Stop being a glass, become a lake. That's an ancient, hundreds of years old anonymous teaching story. And I think what it says, or why I tell it, is that Everyone gets their handful of salt. Everyone gets their amount of pain, their amount of fear. We can't eliminate that, but we can right-size it. And so when faced with fear and pain or a situation like you're in, how can we enlarge our sense of things so we can right-size the pain or fear? So if we don't, we will stay small, the pain and fear will be more acute, and will grow bitter. So the question is, the practice question is, what experiences, relationships, and practices can help you enlarge your sense of things when you meet pain and fear? So you, you might listen to the story and say, oh, well, being in class is not a good thing. I won't do that. Well, yes, yes, you will. And so will I. Because that's how pain and fear say hello. But we don't have to stay that way. And so our personal practice, you know, like, what do you do when you're afraid? Do you uh, read that favorite passage that touches your heart? Do you listen to that piece of music? Do you call up your dearest friend? Do you cook a meal? Do you garden do you go for a walk in nature or stand by the sea so what are the things that are in our toolbox so the next time pain and fear surprise us we can turn and enlarge our sense of things that does make sense and it's also very healing i feel like you're speaking about it like acknowledging that it's there like you're saying i don't have to talk or or like uh, ask my fear what to do necessarily but acknowledging that it's there it doesn't need to go away like i'm going to get rid of it I'm just going to feel good all the time but uh, to move through it like you were saying and uh like sort of speaking of this but your book is called falling down and getting up and in a way, that title to me was a bit healing right there, uh, because sometimes in our society, especially in Scandinavia, uh, it is this notion that we all should be happy all the time and be successful. And if we're falling down, we're sort of not successful. But you're saying that this is very, very normal. In fact, we all, sort of all, all of us go through some fall downs uh, sometimes. Now, share a little bit about why you chose this title. Yeah, so, and, and let me start by saying about what you were saying that, because I think that's a prevalent around the world, this, this, you know, demonizing or pathologizing when we fall down, we're deficient or we're not sick or something's wrong. And the truth is that there's a lot of suffering that comes from resisting legitimate suffering. Like, we are not, um, you know, uh, Carl Jung, one of the things he said was that neurosis is a substitute for legitimate suffering. <laughs> so, it, it, you know, when we can face and help each other face the full range of the human experience by being authentic and caring, we become strong and whole. So... So the book falling down and getting up and the title comes from that in europe in medieval europe when monks were asked how they practiced their faith they said by falling down and getting up and i i love that and it and it's like again you don't have to look for it um but like you can't escape gravity we will fall down we will you know and uh you know i i have um god my oldest friend uh, for over 40 years, Robert, his children are, I'm godfather to his three kids who are now 
in their 30s and just turning 40. But when Eli, the youngest, was um, just learning to go on a two-wheeler bicycle, I happened to be there and there was a this very parental moment, loving moment between um, uh, his mother and father before he first tried to ride the two-wheeler. And his mother said, well, um, I want to run alongside so he doesn't fall. And Robert said, well, I will fall, and I want to be there to help him get back up. And I think that that's a loving thing. Both, both things are wonderful. And so when I was looking into the book, I think that if we back up enough over a lifetime, falling down and getting up becomes like a dance. So the question is not how to avoid falling. You don't seek it out. But how do we meet it? And there are many ways to fall down and get up, not just physically. We can get clear and confused as falling down. We can go through grief, which is falling down. Um, you know, there's all kinds of ways that, you know, we can inadvertently hurt each other and then make amends. So I did learn, you know, it made me think of there, there are uh, other traditions have all kinds of sayings like this. In Japanese, there's a proverb that says, fall down seven, get up eight. And then I realized that in the Hindu Upanishads, which are the anonymous sacred texts in India, filled with metaphors, there's one that talks about how a caterpillar moves. It bunches up, it goes back, and then it inches forward. And it bunches up and goes back, and it inches forward. And they say that this is the rhythm of spiritual growth, falling down and getting up. And that made me remember that when I was going through my cancer journey in the hospital, um, I had a rib, one, uh, one of the surgeries, I had a rib removed from my back. And I woke up in the room, and there was a nurse leaning over me saying, get up, we're going to walk. And I said, like, Who, who's going to walk? <laughs> Um, and then she leaned and whispered, and she said, two steps forward, one step back, which is the same rhythm of healing, falling down and getting up, two steps forward and one back. So the question is, how do we meet this? How do we, what is our rhythm of falling down and getting up as we over a lifetime? And it's not, it's, it's natural. It's not. Uh, unsuccessful or a failure or no no not at all now do you think or believe that we all have some fall downs because i've heard of the concept of vacation lives and i don't know if you heard of it or if you're sort of into that sort of teaching uh, but i've interviewed many who have had near-death experiences uh, and pre-birth memories uh, who said that some, or channelers, who have said that sometimes, you know, a soul could choose a vacation life with not so many contrasts and challenges. Okay. What do you think about that concept? Well, I, I honestly, I think it's denial. I, I think the human, the human journey is both, you know, you've heard the, the proverb is the glass half full or half empty. It's always both. It's always both. This is, there's always light and dark. There's all and dark isn't evil. It's just dark. You know, um, it's always being a human being, being a spirit in a body and time on Earth. We uh, involves struggle, which is not bad. It just is. And so uh, this idea that we can manifest only good things, always stay positive. No, I no, I I, I think. I think that is um, denial of the full breadth of what it is to be here. And we don't have to choose suffering, and we don't have to, um, we do have choices at some point of, uh, you know, what we can do with what we've, you know, we're, we're more than what is, we have to face what has happened to us, but we're more than what is done to us. And by the same token, we can't run from life. We can't run from death. 
the only way I feel to be fully here is to feel everything. You know, Rilke, the great poet Rilke, he said, let everything happen, beauty and terror. No one feeling is final. Keep going. Keep going. I think that life has been made just difficult enough that we need each other to ensure the journey of love. Mm. Yeah, that makes sense. Could you speak a little bit to how, or maybe have some thoughts around, or can share how yourself are sort of um, managing to deal with all the horror that's going on in the world. And I've been thinking a lot about this, that I see people around me handle it better than me. Sort of they, they watch the news and then they're okay afterwards. And I watch the news and I'm devastated. Yeah. And I haven't yet found that balance and how to sort of accept that this horror is going on in Israel and Gaza and everything. And in Ukraine, when you hear those terrible stories, uh, it's like I lose life force. And a part of me wants to protect myself and I'm being a bit personal here. And then sure. it's sort of easier not to look at the news, but then I feel like I'm ignoring it. Uh, and then I'm thinking, okay, uh, this is my work. You know, I, I want to uh, enlighten the world with these interviews with amazing teachers like yourself. But still, like personally, I sort of don't find that way to handle it. Uh, do you, can you speak to that? Yes, yes. So first off, it, it's a struggle for everyone. I struggle with it too. I don't have answers, but let me speak to it. And I think this is a challenge for every life and every age. And it does speak more, again, to this sense, do we face life or do we turn from it or try to deny it? I think there's nothing wrong with you at all because it affects you. Uh, that means that you're fully alive and that matters when we can turn from it. Um, and yet at the same time, we don't, we, we can't drown in it. And this is a challenge for every every person on earth, regardless of the age that we live in. So first, let me just say, back up and say that I think that, you know, when we look at the, the horrors that are happening and the difficulties that are happening, humanity is like a global body. So to take my body physically, if I have one more healthy cell than toxic, I'm considered healthy. I'd like a lot more. But as long as I have one, I'm, I'm on the healthy side. Well, I think humanity is a global body and every soul is a cell in that body. So in addition to the actual actions we can take to relieve suffering, being a healthy soul helps keep humanity healthy and not diseased. So even conversations like we're having matter. So when we look at these things, at, at these horrible things, I think that we, when we are open-hearted and tr authentic, we do become uh, uh, conduits of compassion. And yes, we feel the terrible things that are happening around the world, as we should. And so I can feel sadness that's not mine personally. I can feel troubled. Now, now let's let's talk for a moment about worldwide 24/7 media. So our challenge, I think, is how do we stay open to the suffering of others without being ground down by it? And on the other side is how can we not transcend out of here and and go on as if nothing happened. No, there's a corridor of aliveness in the middle that each person, I think, in our in our authenticity has to find where we are touched and care about life all over, but we're not ground powerless by it. So and we, we can veer to one extreme or the other. We can uh, look at 
be numb and look at the news and go, oh, that's nice. Let's go get ice cream. Um, or we be, can so, be so paralyzed in the heartache that we can't function. And neither extreme does us any good. And being human will we'll spill into one or the other. But that's that. How do we come back? What's in our toolbox, in our relationships, in our practices to bring us back to the corridor of, of aliveness? So, so with 24-7 media, and I'll go back to 9-11 uh, to as an example. Years ago, my wife and I were traveling in Montreal when, when the towers were struck. And, um, and we actually were packing to come home and we saw it that morning on the TV in the, the hotel room. Now, we all know all over the world, we've seen the image uh, of that, of those planes going into those towers hundreds of times. The only value of that is if a hundred different people see it once and take it into their heart. You and I don't need to see it a hundred times. And so, you know, Part, part of the problem with constant media is that we see tragedy so much that it numbs us. And it's part of our practice to say, I have that in my heart. I don't need to see it over and over and over again. I need to be able to feel it and internalize it so I can be an active citizen of the world. Yeah, that makes sense to me. I was just thinking of those who are suffering from depression. Uh, I've suffered from that as well. And I have many people writing me uh, saying that they are depressed. And for me, it was the spiritual thoughts and the spiritual path that really helped me out of it, that I saw that there was something else. Um, and I can assume that many people have contacted you also who are depressed and feeling nothing. and. It's so um, interesting with depression because we come down to this life, to have a life, to live, to have life for us. And then all of a sudden it feels like you just shut down and feel nothing and everything is just gray. Like I remember the sensation. Mm -hmm. um, I'm curious to if you have any thoughts of why certain people experience sort of no life in this depressional state. Well, and again, I don't have answers, but let me speak to it. I think, you know, I think that one of the things that happens, and, and, and let's look at as a metaphor before I talk about that, and that's so clouds. So one of the challenges for all of us is, you know, um, the, the sun is always still shining above the cloud. So often we have, again, these extreme responses. Well, if you know the the positive outlook the vacation outlook the, the turn away outlook says oh well forget about the clouds they're not important don't you realize the sun's shining it's okay and the other is i can't see the sun i start to question if it's still there and i live only under the clouds which is real under the clouds it's damp it's wet it's cold it's dark and the challenge of an open heart and how we help each other, again, the glass is half full and half empty, both are always true. The reality of living under a cloud cover is real. And the sun has never stopped shining. And so I think often depression comes when, through sometimes through no fault of our own, because it is also biochemical. Um, we, we feel so far away from the light that we start to feel like, well, this is all there is. And I think one of the hardest things when people feel depression is that kind of how to reach through it, how to reach out, because it often feels like you can't. So depression, I've learned, is not just about sadness, but a weightiness a heaviness that somehow prevents you from, oh, it, you know, it seems like getting out of the house is a, you, is a, you know, you might as well try to go to China, you know? Um, and, and so again, this, this notion of, 
of whenever possible. Well, well, first off, it is also biochemical. And if, if, you know, we're blessed to have medicines that can help relieve some of the weightiness so we can do the inner work. And I think they go hand in hand. And so um, I think also that there is another kind of source of depression, which is what we were talking about earlier, that if we refuse to feel what is ours to feel, we wind up hovering in a place of no feeling. So that's where fear makes us so afraid of feeling that we lose access to feeling, which makes it worse. Because I believe even if a feeling is difficult, it's worse not to feel at all. Mm -hmm. And so if I'm afraid and I feel like I need help, this is another example of how we need each other. So if I have a feeling that I'm afraid to feel, but I, I kind of know if I don't feel it, it'll be worse, but I don't know how to do it. I need to reach to you as my friend and say, you know, can you come over and help me? Because I'm stuck. You know, one of the chapters in the new book, Falling Down and Getting Up, is a chapter I call the, the Endless Vows. And these are four simple vows that have helped us throughout the ages. Anytime we've engaged in any of these four vows, I think they always return us to a life of feeling and a larger life of spirit and what matters. And the four vows are help, thank you, I'm sorry, and I love you. That was similar to that Ho'oponopono. Have you heard of that? Yes, yes. Yeah, that's beautiful. Yeah, I think it's very wise what you're saying about we need each other, that we're this life is sort of constructed in a way that we actually need to reach out to each other. And very interesting what you said about the cloud and depression, because that's the way I was feeling it. It was like it was a cloud, and then all of a sudden it disappeared. Like from time to time, it started to disappear. And I was like, oh my goodness. I. It was like, yeah, like it was never there. And so I started to uh, work with my ego to sort of let it know every time I felt depressed again that but it might disappear, the cloud might disappear. Know that this won't last forever. It's yes. A temporary state of being. Well, and that's one of the, the hard things also about being human is that we tend naturally to extrapolate and make what we're going through a worldview. So if I am in pain, then the world's a painful place. If I am afraid, the world's a fearful place. You know, if, um, if I'm broken, the world's a broken place. And, you know, I learned during my cancer journey, again, not through any wisdom on my part, but through a very difficult passage that, um, to be broken is no reason to see all things as broken. And while if I'm broken, I need the company of those who know what it's like to be broken. I need everything whole to heal. And when I'm afraid, I need the company of those who know what it is to be afraid. But I need everything safe to heal. And so thank God everything isn't just my experience, because it's, you know, we, we, we rightfully talk in the modern world about diversity as, to, as ethnic diversity or racial diversity, um, and, but not but, but and, there is a deeper spiritual diversity of life that is healing. And that's also why we need to be open to everything. So an example would be water. Water we know is made of hydrogen and oxygen, H2O. I can't say to you, could you give me a glass of the hydrogen, please? Because even if you could separate it, it would no longer be water and no longer be healing or life-giving. And so we need to let everything in and help each other move through the difficulty and celebrate and share the things that are healthy and whole. Hmm. 
Makes sense. Beautiful. Uh, I would like to jump over to something else. Uh, and I'm using myself as an example here. Um, because I know that you were very driven when it came to being a poet and writing. And then it sort of changed in you. And I, I don't remember what words you used. There was like an interview I saw with you. And I sort of identified a bit with that because I've also been very driven. And I felt I found, found my purpose with Wisdom from North. And I um, went from being a musical theater artist in Norway, like a child star. And I lost my voice. And now I found like a deeper voice and all that. And now, like after have been doing this for a long time, I sort of feel like very content in life. And like this peaceful place where I'm just enjoying living and I'm not so driven anymore. And it doesn't mean that I don't want to continue because I love what I'm doing. It's just sort of I just don't have that hunger anymore. And I'm wondering if that's wrong. Like, shouldn't that be there? And what's the next? Shouldn't there be a next? Like, I'm just 43. Like, it's, <laughs> I have hopefully a lot more years to live. So where's that next, you know, purpose or step? Or is it okay? Like, is this part of life that maybe I'm just going to enjoy things I've built? Yeah. Yeah, I, th I think for me, and, and I think that again, this is not a problem. It's, it's a good evolution. Okay. It's a transformation because and, and again, let me go back to that moment for me, or it wasn't a moment, it was a long passage, but before my cancer journey, I was driven. I was a driven young poet, um, and I hoped that if I worked hard enough and was true enough, maybe I'd write one or two great poems, hopefully. Well, then I almost died, and forget, um, and I was in the hospital, and forget writing great poems, I needed to discover true poems that would help me live. Mm -hmm. And now all these years later, I just want to be the poem. Mm -hmm. And so what happened to me was that, and this is a metaphor, a water metaphor, but being driven was like the rush of a strong river. And you can, you know, in a, a strong river, you can hear it moving, roaring, downstream and against its banks it's churning and it's and you know so that was the first way i think it's the first way we understand our passion and our energy but what happened to me was and you know when i woke up on the other side and i actually felt like like you're saying my drive was gone and it was very confusing and disorienting because i thought i lost my gift mm. but what i discovered over months was I was now drawn to things I wasn't driven, which was actually deeper and freer and more joyful. So my inner creative energy was the same, if not more, but it was quieter. And because I was used to only hearing it one way, um, I thought I'd lost it. But it was more like that river, when the river reaches the mouth of the sea, it, go it doesn't the river, the force of the river doesn't disappear. It goes deeper and joins the rest of the water. And so it's quieter and it's more, uh, it goes, it has more room to move and to go in different places. So when you're saying that you're, and it's also, as I was saying that we're, we're there is no there, there's only here. Well, that causes us to stop chasing things. So we think that chasing things, and my dog just came in. Yeah, I saw it. <laughs> but we think when we're chasing things that that gives us a signal, wow, I've got a lot of energy, I've got a purpose, this is all wonderful. And, and it's fine, and it is, but as we grow, we join more with life, we go deeper, and it's the energy is still there, but it's more subtle. And and I have found the freedom of being drawn to things is that, you know, so when I was young, I had a plan to write certain books. Well, now, if I have an idea for a book, 
it's more that I'm discovering the books and I'm on a journey to discover what matters and then and then retrieve it rather than I'm going to create this out of nothing, which is the Western way of the artist playing God. No, I, I think we're inner explorers. And so, you know, the, the creative trail and the trail of service is in, in following what I said earlier about being what is heartening. You know, there's a, a Ramana Maharshi was a great um, a Hindu sage. And one of the things he said was to try to save the world before liberating yourself is like carpeting the earth rather than wearing sandals. So this is the inextricable link between inner work and service. So I don't think that, I think that, you know, this is not the, the world of, if we, if we lose what we call initial ambition, um, that's, that's not a problem. It's a transformation. And Kierkegaard, the Swedish philosopher, Danish, Danish philosopher, excuse me, um, one of the things he said is that anxiety is the dizziness of freedom. Hmm. So not anxiety like I'm going to go to the dentist and I don't want to, but the disequilibrium that things are changing. So like when I, when, when the drive toward things dissipated and, and I, was, I was confused, that was the anxiety is the dizziness of freedom until I discovered I was drawn to things more deeply. That makes sense to me, and I'm glad you spoke to that, <laughs> uh, because I, I can notice in myself that I'm sort of still looking for that ideal way of being. Isn't that funny? <laughs> Instead of just being, I'm, I'm like trying to be something that I've read in some spiritual book or heard in an interview. Uh, and and. A part of me knows that it's not about that, Janke, but still, like, a part of me wants, or my ego, is trying to find that perfect way of being. And then I cannot uh, go against what's happening inside of me. You know, the, the change and the transformation that you call it that's happening, I, I can't work against that. It's, I can't force, you know, the, the drive to come back. You can't. No, and that's good that you can't. And so there's a big difference between, you know, the word perfect, uh, the, the aim for perfection is, I think, is a, a, a miseducation. Um, and, and, you know, in the original, uh, there's a wonderful book by Neil Douglas Plotz called Prayers for, Prayers for the Cosmos. And what he did, he was a, ling he's a linguist. He went back and took the sayings of Jesus and translated them from the original Aramaic language it's believed he spoke. And he found several mistranslations. So, and perfect was one of them. It's said in you know, one of Jesus' sayings, supposedly, be thou perfect. Well, the, the original translation, that was translated into English, but the original Aramaic word didn't mean perfect. It meant be wholehearted. Oh. <laughs> a fork in the road in a thousand years of education. Be whole, so to be perfect is to try to eliminate flaws and it removes us from life. To be wholehearted, you have to be thorough. Mm -hmm. You have to live. You have to follow what's heartening mm -hmm. and be where we are so that the journey of life is not from here to there, but from in to out. So let me give you one more metaphor, which is of a flower. We take this for granted. So flowers, whether it's a wild flower or one you plant, a seed starts underground, and it feels this immense uh, call to grow toward a force it doesn't yet know, light. It has no idea what light is. It's underground. And it grows toward this unknown force. Then it breaks ground. And now it grows in two directions. It grows shoots and roots. 
And when it grows strong enough, it starts to, to show its flower. And, and what does a flower do when it blossoms? It literally reveals its inner beauty by turning itself inside out. And it does this without going anywhere. This is a great metaphor for the transformation that we go through being a spirit in a body in time on earth. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, just exploring what's going on inside is just such a journey. And like you're saying, it's not there, it's it's here. And not working against that, not resisting that, but like a river that is just, you know, moving, like it's almost like I'm I'm trying to catch up with what's going on inside of me. And that is it's so mysterious. You know, this has been very healing uh, to speak with you. And I felt it was the last time as well. Um, and uh, I have three questions that I ask all my guests. Um, the first one is, what is self-love to you? Well, self-love is honoring the portion of universal spirit that each of us is blessed to carry while we're here. And by honoring it, we let we, we can call that soul, we can call that inner voice, we can call, there's a thousand names for it. But by honoring that portion of universal spirit, we can let it be our teacher. Beautiful. And what is happiness to you? Well, happiness, you know, I have a different, so I'm gonna use another uh, uh, water image. Happiness is one of the thousand human moods. So. You know, if you, there are a thousand waves in the ocean. So imagine that those are all different human moods. I like to be happy, but it's kind of like ice, there's an ice cream. It's wonderful. But I, as I get older, I'm more interested in joy, which is the depth of the ocean that holds all the waves. Hmm. Makes sense. And what is the deeper meaning of life from your perspective? Oh, well, we could do a whole nother session on that. Um, but I, I think the deeper meaning of life is simply to live as fully as possible. I think the soul just wants our heart to be as alive as possible. And the way that you, if you keep a fire, you throw wood to keep a fire going, I think the soul wants us to throw care onto the fire of our heart. And it doesn't matter what you care about, as long as you care. And so it is for us to be as alive as possible, as caring as possible for all the days that we're here. Hmm. Beautiful. And now this book is out. And what else are you working on right now if people want to reach out and... Uh... Uh, so I'm, I am uh, teaching, um, actually I'm in February, I'll be teaching in Mexico. You can find it on my website at the Modern Elder Academy, teaching a week in February, which is a very wonderful place. And, and, um, and also my next book uh, coming out next year is a book on friendship, uh, spirit and friendship that will be, is called you don't have to do it alone, the power of friendship. Oh, that's beautiful. <laughs> Your 26th book? Yes. Or... <laughs> yes. Amazing. <laughs> well, thank you so much, uh, Mark. This has been a joy as always. Uh, thank you for doing what you're doing and for coming to the show today. You're so welcome. And, you know, thank you. It's great to be with you. And I'll look forward to next time too. Mm -hmm.